So for this time that I am here on earth, with the only life that I am sure that I get, I'm going to help as much as I can. I'm going to try to be a good neighbor as best as I can. Welcome to Voices of Deconversion. We share the inspirational stories of deconversion told by former Christians who are now atheist or agnostic. Our stories remind us we're in it together. They encourage us as we discover who we are and help us to embrace who we become. Now here's Steve with today's guest. Welcome back everyone for episode 37. My guest today was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. He grew up in a charismatic Nigerian church. Uh, his mom was a deaconess and his dad an elder in the church. He describes the differences between a Nigerian charismatic church in contrast to just your typical charismatic church in America. And the differences were really interesting. It's when he's 16 years old and he's traveling in the UK that he responds to an altar call at a revival meeting. This is when his faith takes a serious turn. He decides that it's best that he cuts off all of his friendships. He later takes a vow of celibacy, and then he begins to attend an even more fundamentalist church. As his life goes on, there are a few moments or events that begin to kind of build a case against Christianity. But he still stays a Christian, a committed conservative Christian. One of the most influential things in his deconversion was when he was watching a specific show on the television channel C-SPAN. He lists some excellent resources at the end of the interview. Um, I had a great time talking to him. He's a really nice guy. He lives up here in, uh, in the Seattle area like me. His deconversion experience was really unique and I loved hearing about it. Without further ado, here is my interview with Benny Bo Ajumagobia. All right, Benny, well, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, thank you for having me, Steve. Yeah, so uh, I always start out just asking, you know, if people, um, if, do you tell people you're an atheist, an agnostic, or is there something else, some other term that you prefer to use? Describe myself as an agnostic atheist. You know, I think, it, yeah, when, when people ask me whether I'm religious or not, I, I tend to describe myself as agnostic atheist these days. Yeah. yeah. That it took, to... some, took some time to get comfortable with it. That's, that's yeah, yeah, I hear you. Now, that seems to be yeah. kind of a... Um, the, the most correct way to describe where most of us are at, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and I know there are some, I've, I, um, sometimes I take part in some of the YouTube great debate stuff. Um, you know, there's some really cool philosophers on YouTube, like Ozymandias the second. And I know he takes, he has some quibbles with the label agnostic atheist. Uh, and he, he's, he's, brought some good points about um, uh, essentially he, to summarize I think his point is agnostic atheism as a label is kind of like a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost like coward is being like a coward and mm. not being more assertive in the proposition of I do not believe that there are no gods and, and he feels like agnostic atheism is kind of a way of hiding from the challenge to you know basically avoiding the burden of proof um, but anyway, mm. I, I, that's, that's how I, I identify myself these days. Cool. Well, um, let's start with your kind of your childhood experience of Christianity. How did it influence you as you were growing up? Oh, okay. Well, that's a really good question. I, so I'm Nigerian. I was born in uh, a city called Lagos in Nigeria. And I think you in the past have had one other guest who is Nigerian yeah. uh, on your show. Um, so yeah, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I was born to a very devout, uh, charismatic Pentecostal family. Mm. Um, my parents were, um, you know, they came out of that, uh, deeper life holiness movement and, uh, they were very, very strict, very conservative, somewhat, I'd say quasi fundamentalist. Uh, so that's, that was the uh, that was the context into which I was born. Um, I grew up in the church, but you know, I was a young guy, a lot of energy. Most of most of why I like going to church was to go play with my friends, yeah. and you know, I, I just 
run around and my mother would be so angry with me. She's like, why don't you pay attention to the servants? And, <sighs> you know, when you're, you're a young child, you know, I, most of the stuff didn't really, you know, didn't really register. Um, uh, but um, I think at the age of 16, I was in the UK. Uh, I think I just graduated high school, but I, I took a year off before starting college. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, went to a revival um, uh, a Pentecostal, you know, week long revival uh, at a church. And I don't recall the sermon the pastor preached, but it was a very affecting sermon. And I felt convicted. Um, and, 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 I, and I responded to the altar call that night at the age of 16. Yeah. And I gave my life to Christ. And, and I truly, truly there was change, uh, you know, I, a lot of the things that I used to do before, like, you know, I had a lot of friends, I had a lot of friends that were in gangs. I wasn't in a gang, but a lot of my friends were kind of on the rough side of things. I cut off all those relationships. And that, you're I talking about friends of, in Nigeria that you grew up yes, with? Yes, in Nigeria. Okay. Yeah, these are friends. I, yeah. Yeah, I went to boarding school, so uh, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of really roughneck type friends. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and so in Nigeria, you you grew up there, and you you didn't really have like your relationship with God didn't really get like serious. It sounds like until you went to the UK. Were you going to college in the UK, or you're just traveling there? I was just traveling. So um, I have uh, two uh, older sisters and two older brothers, and we are spread around the world. Um, my oldest sister lives in the UK, so um, I just. I just decided to travel there. There was a free couch to go sleep on. So, you know, it was nice just to get out and do something before starting college. Okay. Uh, so, and yeah. where did you end up going to college? Uh, I actually, and that's how I, and that's how I wound up in the United States. Uh, at the age of 17, I packed up my stuff and I moved to Washington, DC and I attended Howard University in Washington, D.C., and cool. that's where I received my, my undergraduate degree. Nice. Uh, what did you get yeah. your degree in? Uh, management Information Systems. Uh, I originally wanted to do computer science, but, uh, oh, man, past, uh, I think, past uh, algebra, I think it was uh, applied calculus. Uh, anything past applied calculus, I, I just was not good at. So <laughs> You're I, like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So I, you know, I, I decided for the middle ground, which was um, uh, management information systems. I could get my computer um, training, but I didn't have to deal with all the math. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so between high school and college, you take a trip to the UK and you, you go to this revival and it really like hits you. You, you accept Christ and kind of what changed about your life at that point? You said you cut off some friendships or kind of made some distance between you and your friends, some of those friends. Yeah, it was, it was really profound. So, um, you know, prior to that experience, I, you know, like I said, I went to church, I did all the churchy stuff, but, um, I, and I, you know, and I prayed for forgiveness when I did something wrong, but you know, that you know the 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 thing that was big in our church was you know the fruits of the spirit right the fruits of the inner working of the holy spirit in your life there has to be an outward manifestation of that and prior to 16 it, there were there really wasn't I, I you know i partied with my friends i didn't smoke i didn't drink but you know i i love chasing girls i was I, you know, I, I was, I lived the life, you know, and I hung out with all these guys who were, you know, on the rough side of things. Yeah. Um, and my, uh, and it might, it just drove my mom crazy because my mom was a deaconess in the church. Oh, wow. My dad was, um, yeah, my dad was also ordained as an elder in the church. And here's a, you know, the son of, you know, church officials who's just kind of, you know, partying it up, pursuing the girls. And, and they, my mom would often tell me, you know, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And right now you don't look very good. You don't look very Christian. And so that was my life. Now, when I gave my life to Christ at the age of 16, I came out of that feeling convicted. I, 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 I looked at my life and I was like, look, right now I cannot say there's anything I would 
even remotely describe out the fruit of the spirit uh, mm-hmm. in my life. I, 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 and, I, and I decided that things had to change. So one of the, the biggest things for me was cutting off all my friendships mm-hmm. in Nigeria. So all the guys I used to hang out with, I used to party with, I cut everyone off. I went from having you know, 30, 40 different friendships to having zero, wow. none. I, I cut everyone off. Um, I took on a vow of celibacy. I, I, I made a vow to God. I was like, I am going to become celibate from here on out until the day I get married. And I'm going to do this to honor your name, right? I was going to honor God's name by, by being chaste. Yeah. I, um, I, I stopped partying. I, st- I mean, my land, everything, there was so much change just in my demeanor. I became, I used to have a bad temper. Uh, that went away. I, I, I became more, just more, uh, more laid back more quiet, you know, slow to anger, you know. And, and for me, that was evidence of the, the Holy Spirit truly working something in me, right? Because I, you know, I went from a guy who was running at 60 miles an hour to five miles an hour. Mm. And I was like, wow, there is no way I could have done this by myself. This has got to be the Holy Spirit working in me. Yeah. And, and that, that was really the transformation. It was, it was remarkable. It was truly remarkable. Wow. And so that yeah. was that was at the age of sixteen. You were still living at home. Yeah. So um, uh, just to give you a clear timeline, so yeah. I uh, I spent a year in the UK. So I, I I returned. I went from the UK back to Nigeria, and at that point, I turned seventeen. Um, so I I was at home in Nigeria for maybe three four months, and then I moved to the United States. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I moved August 13th, 2001. That was when I arrived at Dallas Airport in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. All right. So then you start going to school. Well, I guess before we get into like your college years, so what about your parents and your siblings? How did they respond or did they respond to the change in your life? Yeah. Um, so at that point, um, so I'm the youngest of five kids, right? I have two older brothers, two older sisters. Um, at that point, the two, my two old, the two old, pretty much every all the kids had left the house um, and had gone different places. So my oldest brother lived in Nigeria. My oldest sister moved to the UK, and you know she'd been in the UK for some time. My older brother moved to the United States. He was in Colorado, going to. Uh, school up at the Colorado School of Mines for petroleum engineering, and my older sister was also in the U.S. in in D.C. So okay. it was just me and my parents essentially at uh-huh. home. Um, uh, I was very close to my mother. My dad, you know, my dad is a military guy. You know, he was very, you know, I, I said, "Good morning, sir." Good, you know, it was very, very functional, very transactional relationship. It wasn't very emotional. So he, he didn't really notice too much, but my mom, oh, my mom did. My mom noticed. It was, it was night and day. It, it got so bad, like, my mom would, would actually beg me to leave the house. Oh, like, I wasn't God. going out because I, I didn't want to be tempted by my old friends or, you know, to go hang out. So I'd just stay home. I'd stay home. Uh, I'd read a book. I, I, re- I used to read a lot when I was young. Even now, I still read, but... When I was young, I read a lot. So I just stay home and read a book. And she was happy that I had lost all these friends. She was happy that I had changed. But, you know, she wanted a balance. Like, hey, go out. You know, you're a young boy. Go expend some energy outside. Don't, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, she, she noticed. She noticed and she, she made remarks about the change. Wow. What's really interesting about that is I, I think a lot about how religion isolates people. Yeah. And I think, you know, like, like maybe in a, in some respects, you know, staying away from people who were on the outskirts and maybe weren't, you know, the best people in general, like <laughs> getting into trouble and stuff that that's fine. Right. But some of your friends, I'm yeah. sure were good people. They just partied like most kids that age or they were just normal kids. And because of religion, you, you cut everybody out. I, I had a sort of a similar experience where I cut out a lot of my friends that I had partied with in college just for like a short time and 
And I, I look back on that and I'm really sad about that sometimes um, because those were some of those people were great people. You know, I've reconnected with some of them, which is awesome. But um, so I think about that with you, you know, like you cut out all these people um, and that that must have I don't know what what effect do you think that had on you uh, as far as isolation and. You know, at that point in time, I didn't know. So you you, you brought up a great point about isolation and, and fundamentalist Christianity, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, for us, it was important to separate ourselves from the world. It was important to, you know, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Yeah. And what that also meant was in the kinds of relationships you kept. So at that point in time, I did not know enough about the world to to know or to to say whether the way i was living at that time was abnormal for my age i i, I it's it's only now with the with the benefit of hindsight and experience that i look back at that period of my life with a little bit of regret because i had some like you said some really good friends we we had fun and it wasn't always about hanging out with gangs or partying we just would hang out and just talk about the latest comics or you know the latest video games we, we used to play a lot of tekken and Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and we just <laughs> talked about that kind of nerdy stuff all the time, like, you know, and, and I, and I, and I cut off those relationships, uh, because for me, I felt that I was part of the bride of Christ mm-hmm. and I had to consecrate myself. And, and, and if it meant denying myself friendships or the satisfaction of those friendships, then, Hey, then my reward in heaven it's just going to make it better, right? Because I've done the sacrifice here on earth and I'm going to get rewarded in heaven. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's such a sad testament uh, to what religion can do to a young mind. But right. I was, that was where I was. The religion you describe, the Christianity that you describe is so familiar to, I think, what a lot of people in America experience as Christians, if they're charismatic and if they're yeah. kind of, in that Pentecostal kind of world, how was your Christianity different from <laughs> come? Cause I know like speaking to Vix, who was my Nigerian, yeah. my Nigerian guest yeah. from a while ago, there was a lot of, there were some differences. So what was different about the Christianity that you experienced from maybe the average Christian charismatic in America? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And this is something <laughs> I try to explain to some of my friends now. To, I don't think they'll understand. Yeah. So, uh, Nigerian, or I'd say African Christianity, but let me speak to Nigerian Christianity because I do know that very well. It's it is unlike many things you you it is unlike many forms of Christianity that most Americans uh, would be familiar with. It is. Um, so I think you had a guest on. Um, I think he was from Brazil, and he was describing um, the Catholicism that was practiced in Brazil and the infusion of spirit spiriticism yeah. in that in that form of Catholicism. And that is one way. That, that's probably the closest uh, description I can use. So it's it's um, there are different forms of Christianity. So when we were co- we were colonized by the British, right? So um, when the British came. You also had Portuguese uh, influences, so uh, Anglicanism was, is pretty is a pretty big form of Christianity there. So is Catholicism, but Evangelical Christianity and Pentecostal Christianity, especially since the I'd say sixties and seventies, I'd say the seventies and eighties actually just grew like gangbusters, right? Yeah. And in 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 addition to that, you had local. Um, African myth, uh, spiritual mythicism infused into this uh, forms of Christianity, right? That has created something that is so unique. So I'll give you an example. Um, we could be in a church where we're having a revival, right? So it's a typical Pentecostal charismatic uh, church where people are prophesying, you know, speaking in tongues, you know, all that. And then in the middle of that, you could have somebody come out to say, hey, right now, there is a witch in our midst that has oh, been God. sent by the enemy, right? And, and, and then you hear somebody scream, it's like, yes, I'm the witch, I'm the witch, and I came to test the pastor, and, and then they go, they'll try to do an exorcism right there. And wow. the 
exorcism. It could be. I mean, it it and it varies. Like I have seen an exorcism where a woman was slapped, right? Whoa. Because you're right. Because the pastor felt like, hey, this evil spirit is challenging me, and I'm 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 the good guy. You're the bad guy. How dare you come into my sanctuary to talk to me? And he slapped her, right? I have seen where you know a pastor will step on the stomach of, of a woman, right? And say, I am going to purge this evil spirit out of you by stepping on your stomach. Like, it is just insane, yeah. right? But for us, it was normal because that was what we knew. That was what we had grown up with, right? Yeah. And, 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 and believe it or not, as I got older, I moved into an even more fundamentalist even more zanier form of Christianity than the form of charismatic Pentecostalism that I grew up with. It, it, it is, it is, it makes the fundamentalists in the U S look like, like little kids compared <laughs> to what I grew up with. I, I kid you That's not. That's hilarious. Not. No, it's totally true. I mean, compared to like the fundamentalism and the charismatic stuff I was a part of, and there was some weird stuff like Toronto blessing people being, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, during those revival meetings would like bark like dogs or like um, oh. just acting crazy. And so it's, it, but this is like another level, you know, like that's oh. weird. This is like pretty intense. I mean, it is on another it is. level. It is. And, and just as a side <laughs> note, one thing, an observation that I, I think is important to make is a lot of the people who bore the brunt of um, accusation of witchcraft or or being evil spirits were mostly women and, and i think when when i when i take a step back and i look at christianity as a whole it's a very patriarchal setup it's a very male oriented setup right i yeah. mean when you spend enough time reading the bible you 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 see that women aren't even second class citizens they're property right mm. uh and 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 it translates into how the adherents of the really at least some of the adherents of the religion treat women um i cannot tell you how many lives were destroyed because they were accused of witchcraft right like in the united states here you know most christians here you know they they don't pay attention to the old testament they don't pay attention to suffer not a witch to live right that's yeah. that's done yeah that was that was with the the witch burnings in salem that that's all right. In parts of Africa today, right now as we speak, there are people who are dying or being ostracized from their families because they are being accused of witchcraft. And the Christians are paying attention to what the Old Testament says to do with witchcraft, and they are obeying it to the T. Right, which is which is why when I get into conversations with especially liberal Christians in the U.S., I, I, I often tell them like, just because you don't pay attention to the Bible doesn't mean other people don't. Mm, yeah, just because because the I mean the liberal Christian thing is like, oh, let's just take the general principles of the Bible. We don't need to take like the specific stuff. Like it's you know like just be a good person and you know it's a guideline. It, it's kind of this like yeah. real watered down, but like you said. I mean, some people, and there are so many just regular Christians, conservative Christians, you know, that take the old parts of the Old Testament very, very seriously still. But that's something like, you know, you make a good point that, you know, like in Africa, it's completely different. Like if someone in a congregation here said, there's a witch in our midst, I think people would just look at them <laughs> weird, like, um, okay, you know, yeah. and moving on, yeah. you know, like that's a weird yeah. thing, but... But it sounds like that's a that's a serious part of or a big part of the the church experience in Nigeria. It was for me. It was yeah. definitely for me. What what's something you said they get ostracized and and even worse, uh, maybe die. So, do you remember a specific person who you know in in growing up who was accused of being a witch and and you know you said their lives are ruined. Can you think of an example of what happened to someone? Oh, 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 I can think of many examples. I could, if I even need to even go that far, I can even within my own family. And oh, wow. I guess as we go into the podcast and I'll share more, but even sure. within my family, um, within my siblings, 
we, you know, we, we're not all as close as we all used to be. Mm -hmm. Some, some of the reason, some, not all, but some of the reason is because, you know, maybe one sibling was thought to be possessed by evil spirits. And, and so, you know, we don't, we're not going to be as close to that person as, as, as we used to, or we're not going to share a lot of the things going on in our lives as we used to, because they might be conducting surveillance on us for an evil power. Right. I mean, oh, it, that, man. that happened within my own family. So I don't, I, I could go out outside my own um, personal context to get examples, but I don't need to. I can, it happens sure. to me. So people just get ostracized. Family just doesn't talk oh, yeah. to them. Oh yeah, you get ostracized. You know, you're, you're, you're. I mean, for luckily for me, in my context, the, the worst that happened was, you know, relationships that were strong before just became weak. Uh, that that was the extent of it, right? But wow. there are other, there are other instances where people are killed. There are instances where people are rendered homeless. There is a Nigerian atheist. I think his name is Leo Igwe. Yes, and I've heard he, of him. I, Oh, he, he's a phenomenal guy. I've never met him, but I, I looked at some of the projects he runs. And um, one of the things that he's heavily involved in is providing uh, homes and shelters for women and children who've been um, accused of witchcraft and rendered homeless. Um, there's also a, Dan a young Danish woman who has a program, and she has this website. I don't recall the website that specifically... Um, it's it's for providing homes for orphan children who have been accused of demonic possession or witchcraft or wizardry. She she actually runs a shelter in Nigeria for those kids. Oh wow, that's amazing! It just tells you how yeah, yeah. how pervasive the witchcraft stuff is. If people are having to create shelters for people who've been accused of it. Oh, it is, it is, and and mind yeah. you, that's in Nigeria. There are other parts of Africa where they're just outright killed. Right. They're Jeez. they're parts of Eastern Africa where, you know, even if you're like an albino, uh, you people straight up just murder them and use their parts for rituals. Right? Are, it, it is it is all sorts of weird. Is that like overlooked by the government or is it if someone gets caught, they go to jail for murder? Uh, you know, I. It's, I've been I've been out of the country for oh. almost 20 years, so I, I don't know what it is right now. Yeah. But when I was growing up, uh, oh, the government was barely functional in that aspect, right? I mean, because again, the regular citizens are, I mean, this, the influence of religion is so pervasive that it, and it doesn't escape uh, government officials, law enforcement officials aren't somehow immune from the, those influences. They yeah. are, they, they're, they're beholden to it. I mean, there, there, uh, there'll be some, there'll be like, I can think of like an example where there was a robbery going on and the police didn't want to respond, right? Because they were afraid of the robbers. Wow. But in, in one instance, one of the police officers had a charm, like a protective amulet that he thought would protect him from bullets. Obviously it didn't protect him because he died, but <laughs> it, you know, there, there are parts of there, there it, it's, it's so the influence of religion and religious thinking is so pervasive yeah it, it touches every facet of the of of nigerian life from the government down to the local commoner it, it's it's a total well i appreciate you kind of given that background and, and that information because i think it helps me and you know people listening understand kind of the christianity that you came from and yeah uh but i do but you know i kind of got a sidetracked a little bit so i want to get back into no your story for sure so um we kind of left off when, you know, we're talking about you, you've gone through this revival, your mom's kind of saying, Hey, you should get out, but she's glad that you've kind of cut off some of your friends. So where did your kind of your journey go from there? Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I, I was, after I left the UK and I went back to Nigeria, I was only there for, like I said, three, four months. And, uh, and, and then I, I, it was time to go, um, because, um, school semester you know I, I had to report to howard university for the start of fall semester uh which started in september so uh we got on a plane my mom and uh and i got on the plane we flew from Niger lagos nigeria to washington dc august 13 2001 dallas airport <laughs> and um 
and you know my my older sister at that was was uh, was living in DC at that time. So she and her fiance at that time had a home. So I was living with them. Um, we also they had also plugged into a Nigerian church that you know was of the same. Uh, just a, 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 a the Maryland branch of the church I grew up I, I came up uh, in. Uh, it's a church called Mountain of Fire Miracles Ministries, and they're they're all over the world. Um, so we we found a branch in in Maryland and we plugged in. But uh, it, my experience also so my birthday is in September, and September 11th happened uh, three days before my. 18th birthday wow and that was a very that was my that was you know it was a transformative experience like for many people but it was for me because i had only been in the country for uh less just just under a month and the attacks happened and uh so we have the attacks in new york but also there were the attacks in on the pentagon and that uh, we had to evacuate college we had to leave school um and I had a lot of cl- classmates whose parents worked at the Pentagon oh, wow. who were affected. Yeah. And so um, we, you know, that was something, I think for the first time, it struck me how a, an interpretation, a religious interpretation can lead to very destructive, uh, to very destructive actions. Uh, because, you know, at that point in time, I grew up a Muslim, right? Nigeria is... Um, it's almost 50-50, but I'd say slightly more Muslim. And I, I grew up in Muslims. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm very comfortable around Muslims. But I had never really given it much thought, right? Because for me, Christianity was the obvious true religion. You know, Islam was false. Like, yeah, there are nice people, but Christianity, come on. It, obviously, Jesus is the main guy, right? Yeah. But it was, it was after the attacks of, of September 11th that for the first time, I had to like stop and think about religion. Now, when I thought about religion, I was thinking about Islam. I wasn't thinking about Christianity. Of course, because for yeah. me, you know, my your 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 defense mechanisms are are they're there to protect those core beliefs, those strongly held core beliefs. But but for the first time in my life, I I actually thought about religion and how it can be destructive, and it was. The attacks of September 11th that totally caused that to happen. Wow! Um, yeah. But uh, it's a power, powerful, powerful, yeah, that... powerful moment, and probably hit you even harder. Well, one, you're in the DC area, and two, it's right before your birthday. So, like every year, you're gonna remember, like right before my birthday, I remember that happened. You yeah, know? yeah, it's impactful for yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, mind you, I was an immigrant. I was uh, on a student visa, right? Because at that, I mean, we live in a climate now that's kind of kind of charged around immigration. But uh, I remember just after September 11th, like you know, different you know talking heads on C-SPAN were proposing, you know, putting ankle bracelets on foreign students like me. And I remember saying in my head, I remember this conversation that I was having with myself, like, but I'm Christian. I'm one of you. Like these people, the people who did that weren't one of us. Why? Why would? Why would you want to? Re- like I don't believe what they believe. All uh, right, and uh, talk about bigotry, right? Yeah. Talk about uh, about being so close-minded. But that was what I believed at 18 years old. That's uh, an eye. You, that's an eye opener. I mean, no, it is. It is. Uh, and 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 at, at that at that point in my life, I was very conservative. I was. I was Fox News, you know, watching Christian radio, listening. Like I, that was me. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> and so you feel uh, like I'm. From, hey, I'm on your team, and then you've got. I'm people, on your. I'm on your side. Yeah, and you've got people like basically dividing you from the rest of the people on the team and saying, "Well, no, you're different." Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was interesting, but I was totally believing that. I, I, hey, Greta Van Susteren, I am on your side. Yeah. But, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. That that was my experience at that point in my life. Wow. Um, okay, so you're at Howard. This happens. Um, how does your faith faith develop and mature from from then from that point? Yeah. Um, so Howard is you know it's a it's a historically black college. Um, one thing you have to understand also in the black community in the U.S. and I, I'd argue around the world. 
religiosity, especially Christianity, is so deeply ingrained into the psyche. And so I'm on Howard campus, and you know I'm surrounded with all sorts of Christians and all sorts of Black people with from all sorts of backgrounds. Like it is, it is just a collection of. A, it shows the diversity within blackness, right? And yeah. I was exposed to this, and 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 I was also exposed to different types of Christianity, because up until that point, I believe it or not, I was of the opinion that the version of Christianity I believed in was the dominant version of Christianity. Mm. This is so obvious. Like, come on, how don't you believe in exorcism or or or, or laying of, of hands or? Or speaking in tongues like how, how can you not but you know i met jehovah's witnesses i met black mormons i met you know black evangelicals i, I mean all sorts of traditions and and i think for the very first time i was like whoa ooh, there's more than what i believe like there's like people who people there are people who don't believe in laying a hand like what is that yeah you know uh but you know again when you're when indoctrination is really strong, it, it has a way of defending itself. Right? It has a way of erecting those shields to protect itself. And and I went through college even stronger in my faith. I I, I doubled down. I was uh, I, I I started working in the church. I worked in the uh, in the in the technology department. I was build I built the website. I worked in the audiovisual team. I was committed. I was deeply committed to um, my faith. I was deeply committed to Christ. I, 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 as I got older, I got deeper into the faith. Um, and, 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 and I remember there was one particular event that stands out to me. I had, so I was an MIS major. Um, I had work experience working for the technology department uh, in my school, for the School of Business. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have any real internships. And I was getting close to graduation time. And I, I had no real world experience, right? I had no internships on my resume. And I just remember feeling so depressed and sad about that. And then my mom and I did like, uh, we started a fast and prayer session, a week long fasting and prayer session, uh, just praying for job opportunities. So, one day I get a, I get I, I submitted my job through the um, the School of Business's um, uh, resource center. They try to hook you know the students up with jobs. So um, I get an email one day. I'm like, hey, uh, there's this company that's interested in interviewing you. You know, come come do the application form. And I was like, whoa, our prayers just got answered. So you yeah. know, I had interviewed with a company called Fannie Mae for an internship. Um, and I was like, this is so great. This is, I can't believe this is happening. God has answered our prayers. And then almost like a week after that interview was completed, I get the opportunity to interview with Microsoft. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. For, for, for a co-op or a six month internship. And, 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 and I go through the interview and I get, I get the position. Cool. And, and I, I mean, it is, so I'm besides myself, right? I'm, you know, this is, again, just another confirmation that God is with me, that the Holy Spirit is working uh, uh, for, you know, you know uh, my, 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 my thoughts towards you are, are of good, not of evil, to give you an expected end. And here's the Holy Spirit giving me the expected end that I wanted. So I, I do, I come out to Seattle for the first time in 2005, and I do six months at Microsoft, and uh and everything is great, you know. Again, this is just confirmation that God is working on my behalf. That He's His still small voice is is, is there, is present with me. Um, so yeah, uh, things are going great yeah. up until I think twenty ten. That's where things kind of take a turn. Uh, so, um, hmm. in the, in the, in the interim, I had switched denominations to an even more fundamentalist branch of, uh, of, of Nigerian Christianity. <laughs> wow. So you're doubling down. Oh, double down, buddy. Double down. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it is it is remarkable how uh, how deep I got into this. Right? But what's cool is like I'm thinking the whole time I'm making note of these things that were really really important that probably played a role later on because they they accumulate it's the 9-11 stuff and then it's being at howard and being exposed to all these different viewpoints these things kind of accumulate and then as time goes on it's like they create a bigger picture and and it i'm i'm just seeing it as like there's these little things that happen in our life and they seem insignificant or you just kind of make a note of them but later it's like the total sum of them it really is is uh I don't know. It makes a big impact. Oh, it does. You, you are absolutely right. I think somebody described it. Like, it's like a, it's like a mosaic. It's like a painting, like little things here and there. When you're starting the painting, you don't necessarily see the, the final product, right? But the, the little things come together. And by the time you accumulate enough of them, you come up with this giant work of art, this, yeah. this beautiful painting that, that has meaning. And for me, there were these little events here and there that in that particular moment, they, they, were, they didn't mean much in the grand scheme of things. But as I got older, as I accumulated more experiences, they just started to form this mosaic, this rich painting of experiences and confirmation. Obviously, at this point, you know, I am not aware of all these types of logical fallacies and biases, right? You know, confirmation bias. Like, I, I, I am completely oblivious to the ways our brain can trick us. I, yeah. I'm, for me, this is the Holy Spirit working. This is obviously the Holy Spirit working. Yeah. Nothing else, right? For sure. And 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 in a, but it's even more remarkable that I move from this ver a version of Pentecostal charismatic Pentecostalism to an even crazier former christian right? how was how was it crazier uh, okay so um within nigerian christianity there are these uh there's this denomination called the um they're called spiritual churches um they're called uh white garment churches um so there's a particular branch of that called the holy or the sacred order of cherubim and seraphim right wow so this 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 is a denomination that it's it's a it's an old one it's um it it's it's it started the founder of the of that denomination was an anglican but he also i think he infused a lot of local um spiritual beliefs into this okay. with a healthy dose of old testament um uh, uh, uh prophetic teachings um so it's funny when my, my fiance, she's, she's a Christian. She's like more of a liberal Christian okay. and you know, she'll say, Oh, the, the old Testament doesn't matter. I'm like, Oh my gosh, if you knew me when I was still in the faith, <laughs> you would not like me because for me, the old Testament was just as relevant. If not oh more. man, that's so funny. Uh, but so this is, this is, so think about like a church where, you know, you're, you wear white, the men wear white gowns. The women wear white gowns. Wow. Uh, the women have to have their head covered. Women can preach. They can found the church, but they cannot be like, so when, when you go into the church, there's an altar, there's a raised altar where we have like crosses and the elders sit up there. Women cannot sit up there. Cannot, cannot sit up there. It is, it, you know, and when you also, when you're in the church, you cannot have your shoes on. Hmm. Interesting. You can, you are on holy ground. It's kind of like um, the scene where um, Moses first encounters the burning bush, right? Yeah. And the angel comes as like, you are on holy ground and he has to take his shoes off. I mean, that is the principle is the church is a holy ground. This is the, the power of God. The power of the Holy Spirit is in this dwelling and you cannot have your shoes on. If you're a woman, you have to have your head covered. You cannot be at, on the altar. You just cannot be. Um, but it's also charismatic, right? So there are, each, there are gifts uh, that each person has, and that gift will determine your function in the church. One of the main, the biggest or most important gifts is the gifts of the prophetic gifts, or we call them holies, H-O-L-I. They're kind of, holy cow, man, this is going to sound so bizarre. Uh, so they have the ability to bridge the gap between the spiritual world and the physical world. 
So, so think about like the Matrix, right? The movie where um, Neo to get into the Matrix, he has to sit in that chair and get jacked into the into the Matrix, right? Yeah. In the church, there are these holies or prophets or prophetesses who have a unique gift, where an angel can take over their bodies, and then they go into a trance, and that trance can last anywhere from a couple of hours to two weeks, to wow, twenty days. And during that time, they are incapacitated. They, they are. Some people have to take care of them. They have to clean them, have to feed them. Like they're they're out of it, right? And that angel essentially inhabit just basically takes over and is going to speak. The basically give messages from the from the from the holies of holies from the spiritual world, and give it to the people. And the language is not English.、Hmm. It is it is a version of Arabic. It is a it's a mixture of Arabic and Yoruba, which is a local Nigerian dialect. It's a mixture of Arabic and and and、uh, and, and 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 Yoruba. And so somebody has to translate what they're saying into English for people to understand. Okay. And so. Uh, my my sister actually was one of them, and you know, so I as my sister got into that denomination, I went along with her, and so this is so. I mean, dude, you have to see this stuff, you have to experience it to understand it. It is probably one of the most bizarre things I've ever experienced in my life. Wow! And 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 and, and we and in that denomination, just like you found in the Old Testament, the sacrificial laws, we still we we obeyed that. So. Let's say I had a dream that、um, somebody killed me in the dream, right?、Mm-hmm. That dream is going to be interpreted as, "Hey, the, your enemies are—they've done something to you in the dream. Maybe they've given you poison, or you're, you know, they've made you sick in the dream. Anything that happens to you in the dream is going to be manifested in the physical world. So, if you have a dream that somebody killed you, that's a bad, bad thing." So you need to do something about that very quickly. So in my case, for example, I had a dream, or somebody had a dream that I died. So one of the prophets interpreted that as I was going to fall sick and very、mm. quickly will die. So、oh, wow. they needed to do they needed to do something to make sure that didn't come to pass. So in 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 that denomination, we have this the, the lingo is called you have to do a job. You have to do a job for you. And what that job is essentially is, the prophet will consult, or they'll go pray, and then get direction, and then they will do whatever they, that message says they should do. So in my case, to prevent me falling sick, it involved paying somebody in Nigeria to find a a cow, a pure white cow with no blemishes, and then they took that cow to like a cemetery at midnight, and then they killed the cow. They they dug a pit. Then they drained all the blood out of the cow into that pit. Wow! And then, and then they started to pray and do like, like incantations to invoke the spirits that wanted to kill me. And the idea is, there is life in blood. Rather than have this guy's life, there is blood to appease you. Can you have this blood in substitution for Benny's life? That's crazy, right? So, so that's one. That's one part of the job. The second part of the job is they had to build a small hut. They built a, a small hut. Then they prayed on that hut. They did some invocations of the spirits that wanted to kill me, and then they burned that hut down. Wow! So that just gives you an example of what I'm talking about. So、right? that so, so I, that actually happens. So some people kill the cow for you. Happened. Yes,、That's、I paid so money. So nuts. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, yeah. When when people when I see fundamentalists in you know in, in the U.S. talking about this and that, like Stephen Anderson, I'm like, dude, you got nothing.、Yeah. You got nothing. Yeah, compared to yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> compared to that, you got nothing, buddy.、Uh, but yeah, that was、wow. that was where I was in,、um, and and I and I was doing that. I and and the thing is, the crazy thing is,、um, prophecy. And spiritual messages shape every aspect of your life. You you live by the prophetic word.、Hmm. You, I mean, literally every decision I made 
any major decision I made, if it's a new job or somebody I was dating, or I had to seek prophetic counsel. Yeah. Right. So, so for example, there was some, there was a lady I was dating. We were pretty serious, and um, I was like, hey. I, I want to know if I should get married to this woman, right? So I talked to one prophet. They're like, uh, thus saith the Lord, you can marry this woman. I'm like, okay. Then I talked to another prophet. Thus saith the Lord, you cannot marry this woman. I'm like, wait, what the heck? How, how can you both be consulting God and having different answers? And we did this with five different prophets. And I swear we had three yeses and two noes. Wow. Uh, and so I was like, wait. What, what what is going on? You know, what, what is this about? But in in the end, I had to break up my relationship with with that woman because I was given a prophetic message that if I married her, the 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 start of the marriage would be great, but midway into the marriage, it would turn to just chaos, and I would hate my life. Wow! And I broke up because of that. That's just so crazy. Uh, she, 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 it, she took it very hard. She, I mean, she'd been redated for, for a while and, and I just broke up with her wow. and, and she, yeah, it, it was crazy. But that was my life. So destructive up to people's world. lives. I mean, it's just, it's ruining people's lives on so, so many different levels. It is. But again, when you're in it, right, when you're in it, you don't see that. You don't, you don't see it because to- obedient Complete obedience to God and God's message is far more important than anything else. You, you, you if if the if God says jump, you you jump. You don't you don't ask whether your jumping is going to inconvenience your neighbors below you. You just jump yeah. because again, God is not a respecter of man. Yeah, it does. He is sovereign. Yeah, it doesn't matter how crazy the idea is or how drastic the decision is or the implications, like you said, on anybody around you. It's if God said, do it, you just obey. You do it. Yeah. That, I mean, obedience is better than sacrifice is something. It's a very common um, saying in Nigerian society. You just you just obey. Yeah. And and, and, and that's, that's what I did. Wow. Up until 2010. All right. 2010 so, yeah. Take, take me to 2010. I'm excited to hear <laughs> how things develop from there. So, uh, 2010, um, so just to give you some context. So, uh, I have this, I, am a, I'm a very, um, I live, I have habits and I am a very, I'm, I'm routine based. I have routines. Um, so Sundays for me at that time was I go to church, I come back home, I do grocery shopping, then I do laundry, I iron my clothes and prep for the work week. And then I usually watch C-SPAN book TV. Because again, I love to read C-SPAN Book TV. You have authors and speakers come on, and they're presenting all sorts of stuff, and it's just fun for me. Okay. So, uh, 2010, I think it's somewhere in the summer of 2010. I'm ironing my clothes, and uh, on C-SPAN Book TV, they have this author that at that point I had never heard of. Uh, his name was Bart Ehrman. Ah, I love uh, Bart Ehrman. And yeah, that, that, at that point, I, I had no idea who this man was. Did not know. <laughs> cool. About, nothing about him, nothing about biblical scholarship or higher criticism, nothing, uh, knew nothing. Did you say this was me, C- C-SPAN? C-SPAN Book TV, yes. Book this TV, is a, interesting. Like, yeah, C-SPAN Book TV. I think they do it on C-SPAN 3, I think. Okay. Because it's like C-SPAN 1, C-SPAN 2, C-SPAN 3. Got it. Um, and I know this because if, if you're in D.C., you're a political animal. Most, A lot of us are political junkies, political news junkies. So C-SPAN, I mean, that, that's how I spent my weekends until like watching C-SPAN. I mean, think about that, right? But uh, uh, so Bart Ehrman was on C-SPAN and uh, he was given a presentation. Now, again, for me, growing up, we were adherents to the 1983 Chicago Statement on on proper interpretation and proper exegesis of the Bible. The Bible is the inerrant, literal word of God. There is, the Bible interprets itself. Mm-hmm. There may be minor errors, but it's mostly, you know, errors of wording or spelling, but there is, it is, it is the word of God yeah. from God's mouth to the ear of man. That's it, right? So we, we're, the, we're, again, adherents to the 1983 Chicago Statement. Um, so that's my background there. So 
Pat Arman is on. I think he's giving a presentation based off a book. I think it was either Misquoted, I think was the book. I forget. So he's he's talking about errors and forgeries and 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 inconsistencies in the Bible. I'm like, come on, no, there, no, there is no such thing. This is this is the this is a lie of the devil. This is this is not this is the this is from the pit of hell. But I listen anyway. And Bart Ehrman goes on to talk about uh, uh, inconsistencies and contradictions in the Bible. Now, most of them are minor, but there are some big ones, right? And so he's just going through mostly it's all New Testament stuff, right? And 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 I had never in my life ever heard anything like that. No one had taught me to read the Bible the way Bart Ehrman was reading the Bible. I, I for me it was you pick up the Bible, you ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, you open a chapter, and that's what you the Holy Spirit that's what the Holy Spirit wants you to read. Mm. And and in and so Bart Ehrman is going on this lecture, and he completely blows my mind. Not in a good way at that point in time. Yeah. And so a seed was planted. I didn't know it at that time, but that presentation planted a seed. And so in the presentation, he had also talked about apocryphal books of the Bible. Again, at that point, I did not know there was anything else like Old or New Testament apocrypha. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know the history of Christianity. didn't know the history of the Bible. I just knew the Bible was there, KJV only, and that's what I read. Hmm. So Bart Ehrman went through his presentation, and, and, I, and I remember I, I stopped ironing my clothes. I was just like, I, I, I had to take a seat like okay what have i just heard and why haven't i heard this before wow uh my first instinct and my first reaction was this is the deception of the enemy the devil is trying to deceive me and 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 i owe it to myself to not let him deceive me right you know it always says be careful of what you let in right be yeah. careful of what you listen to and 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 for me i was like i have i made a mistake i shouldn't have listened to this and so I tried to put it out of my mind. I tried to forget about it. I tried my best. But I'm a very inquisitive person. And so I was like, you know, at the very least, let me look into this apocryphal thing. Let me, let me go find out what that is. So I order a new Bible. It's a, it's a Bible that has a New Testament and Old Testament apocrypha. I was like, what? There is this, what is the book of Maccabees? What is, what is the book of Tobit? <laughs> what is what is this you know and so um I, I i i start to struggle i start to struggle with like okay what if there's stuff i'm missing what if there's stuff that i don't fully know right and so i'm struggling with this so i reach out to my sister my older sister she's you know she's a prophet a prophetess i trust her and i'm like look here's here's what i find here's what i you know what what is going on and her response to me was very, 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 was, was, was crucial, right? It was, look, there's a lot about life we don't know. There are so many secrets that God hasn't revealed to us. Yeah. God knows best. And what we need to do is put aside these questions, work towards our salvation with traveling and fear, get to heaven, and then ask God. Let God explain it. Right now, we don't have the answers. So basically, she's telling you, just don't think about those things just put them out of your head yeah right. because in our denomination doubt That's... is a sin yeah you're letting the doubt devil in it's a sin i thought you of are... those shields oh. you mentioned you're putting up those religious shields it's, it's it's even more than that it's even more insidious than that the very the very act of having a doubt of saying maybe this might that is a sin because what that stands for is you do you lack total trust in Jesus, and that's a sin. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean like if, if this was a con man, like I you this is multi level marketing strategy on steroids, right? You you basically insulated yourself from questioning. Like you you yeah. can never doubt. But I, again, at that point in time, I, I was like, eh, that's normal. So what you it's what, crazy? Yeah. What did you think of her advice? I mean, did did that kind of console you a bit? Like, okay. I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I just gotta, I, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I, I took it, I'm, and I remember we from there we pivoted uh, a way to start talking about Paul Washer. I don't know if you, you're familiar with Paul Washer. No, I'm not actually. Paul Washer is a is one of he's a he's a one of the, I guess he's a very well known Calvinist preacher, and uh, if you if you want to feel guilty about yourself, go listen to Calvinist teachings, and that that you will stop doubting very quickly. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, uh, and so. The, I went through a I went through a phase of dabbling in some Calvinist teachings, and that put the doubts away for a time. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so you kind of plugged into him a bit. All right. So you again yeah. again. I mean, I've seen this so many times with with people deconverting is something happens that makes them doubt or it's difficult to process, and they double down on their faith or they become even more devout, and it just seems like this is a pattern, you know, and. And here you've been challenged, and it's like, okay, nope, nope, got to be strong, no doubt, you know. Yeah, it, it, because I mean, and this is something that took me time to realize. Baked into Christianity is our several self-defense mechanism, right, to protect itself. It's it's kind of like um, there's a I, I watch a lot of anime, and one of my favorite series is Ghost in the Shell, and and you know they have these. Um, uh, you know, viruses that you know, attack the brain cases. And the viruses have barriers to protect themselves from being removed. And, and that's one mm. way to think about Christianity, at least for me, is this is a, is a thought virus. It's, a, it's an idea that has in itself baked self-defense mechanisms to protect itself, right? So don't question me. Don't question this teaching. Just accept, trust, obey. And, and it took me several years to come to the realization that any idea or any person who wants you to accept them without questioning isn't worth anything, yeah. isn't worth that belief. And dangerous. It is dangerous, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I did, at that time, I didn't know it, but I, I learned my lesson, but um, yeah. Yeah, so then what happened after, after this time of really kind of focusing again on, on not having doubt? Yeah. What was so, the next phase? yeah. So I, I put it, I was able to successfully kind of suppress a lot of that and just kind of keep on moving. So um, uh, in 2011, I broke up with my, with my ex at that time because of the prophecy that I was given. Mm. And so, you know, we broke up. It was, it was really hard. I, she took it hard and I took it hard as well. And so in 2011, I'm, I'm at my job. I, I, for the first time, I feel dissatisfaction with my life. I, I just like, well, I've, I the, prior to that, at a point where I was like, I wanted, I want to get a better job. I want to have a better position. But 2011, after I broke up with my ex at that time, I was truly just, I, I needed to get out. I felt like I was trapped, and I needed to get out. And so I started to look for jobs outside of the DC area. And then I got a, I got a job uh, at Expedia. And so I, I relocated from DC to 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 Seattle in 2012. So what happened um, when I thought you had gotten a like an internship at Microsoft? Was that yeah, so before I, all of this? Yeah. So I got my internship at Microsoft in 2005. Okay. I, I was there for six months. Uh, I unfortunately gotcha. didn't get a full time offer. Okay. I got a job back in DC, so I went back to the East Coast and I worked. I worked in the financial uh, services industry for up until 2012. Okay. When I so, to work with Expedia. Got it. so it's kind of back and forth. So then you're in DC and then now you, you get this job with Expedia in the Seattle area. Yep. Okay. So I moved, I moved to Bellevue in, in the fall of 2012. And, uh, and again, all this time since the age of 16, I'm celibate, right? I no sex, no, no, I mean, just, swear swear off sex mm -hmm. um, so i come here i'm a single guy uh i'm looking for ch a church but i'm like all the churches here are weak churches they, none of there there are just no churches here that are as on fire as i as I, I like them to be or as i'm used to them being um and so i start to look for churches online somewhere along the line I stumble on a clip of Matt Dillahunty on the Atheist Experience. Uh -huh. 
And, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that show. Um, I know who he is, but I'm not too familiar with his work or, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a call-in show based out of Austin. I think the Atheist Community of Austin uh, does this. It's a call-in show, so theists of all stripes call in, and, you know, they have conversations. And, and it's so, I mean, at that time, I had never heard anything like that, but I remember this one clip where, you know, first of all, up until that point, I did not even know what an atheist was. I did mm-hmm. not know there were they were atheists, like, in any real sense. Like, I, I knew that there were people who didn't believe in God, but we'd always joke, like, oh, these were people who are going to go to hell anyway. They were going to burn in hell. But I didn't really spend any significant time looking into atheism or what atheists thought. Or I, I, I knew nothing. I was ignorant. Yeah. So there was this show. I stumbled on a clip called The Atheist Experience, and they're having these argue, or debates with Christians. And I'm like wait, this Christian is making an argument similar to what I would make. And here's this atheist, this non-believer that was providing a, re- a, re- a refutation or rebuttal that made a lot of sense. Wow. Like, wait, what the hell is going on? So, so I, I watch a few episodes, but then, again, the self-defense mechanisms kick in. Like, what are you doing? Why are you watching this? This is the pa- this is a pathway to sin. This is a pathway to doubt. So I yeah. put that aside. I found a church. I plugged in. Now, um, and again, just some additional context. Uh, from my time at Howard to this point in time, I had made changes in my life. So I, like I said, when I was younger, I was a deep, staunch conservative, like Fox News, you know, AM Rush Limbaugh type, you know, conservative. Yeah. And I had gradually, gradually peel that away to become very very liberal moderate liberal kind of guy um you know so just to, i okay. had i put i put that as context to give you like i had gone through a change right in yeah. in one aspect of my life but this one aspect my religion i had shielded it carefully um so i'm in seattle so i'm, I'm now here one day, I have a conversation with a guy online on Reddit, and um, he asked me a question about the Bible. I forget what the question was, but I couldn't answer it because I didn't know what it was. So I was like, mm. this is bad. Like, why don't I know? Why can't I not? Why, I'm a Christian, right? I've been in Christianity for this long. Why can't I not provide a clear, biblical, sound answer to this question? So... I decide that I'm going to spend time studying the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to, I'm going to just learn. And so I recall the I recall the lecture that Bart Ehrman had given, right? Because one one in his presentation, he had given some advice on how to read the Bible to see some of the contradictions. Mm. The way I was raised to read the Bible is you read it linearly, right? You go, you, let's say you start. Matthew chapter one, you read it, you know, down till you get to the next chapter. Bart Ehrman said, no, what you need to do is read the stories across. Mm, right? So okay. if you if you if you read Matthew one, like let's say you read the birth narrative, read the birth narrative in Matthew, read the birth narrative in Luke. Mark doesn't have a birth narrative on this either. So what I did is I went out, I spent some money, I bought I bought like a bunch of Bibles. And so I started. I started my journey of reading the Bible. And, oh, it, it didn't take long oh, <laughs> for, wow. for, for, the, for the issues to start to pop out. It didn't take long. I mean, first thing is like, well, what was the genealogy? What was, uh, did, what was Jesus' genealogy? I mean, you know, one, 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 one author has the genealogy to trace through Mary. The other has it through Joseph. Oh, okay. Why, why is that? Like, if it's the inerrant literal word of God, it should be the same. But it isn't. Mark doesn't even bother, right? Mark doesn't even have any of that. Like, okay, uh, wh- you know, how, where, where, you know, what happened at the crucifixion? What was the, what were the last words of Jesus? Was it Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani? Or was it, Father, um, uh, you know, if past, let this, you know, why have thou forsaken me? You know, the, 
there are differences. I, 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 it's escaping me off the top of my head right now. But yeah. In significant parts of the stories of Jesus' life, there are big differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke that cannot be explained away easily. I didn't know this up until the time I actually started studying this. Mm. And so I start to see these contradictions. So one of my favorite is um, how did Judas Iscariot die, mm. right? In, in, in the book of Act, Luke Acts, he's, uh, I think he, he, he hits, I think a, uh, uh, he hits a wagon, he falls down, his stomach swells up and bursts open with maggots coming out. Whereas in, I forget what, uh, what other book, he hangs himself. Yeah. He, he returns the 30 uh, pieces of silver to the Sanhedrin and then he goes hangs himself. Like, how can he do both? How can he, how is that yeah. even possible for him to die by, <laughs> so, yeah. So the issue started really quickly. So I was like, okay. And I remember that feeling. I, I, I it was, you know, when you're, the, when people say, you know, the, the, the floor was taken right out from underneath me. Yeah. That's the feeling I was having. I, 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 I felt, I felt nauseous i felt i i felt lost i was like okay something something doesn't make sense yeah it, 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 i I'm, I'm missing something here i believe this book to be completely inerrant to say the same things about the stories of jesus and about the disciples and the apostles and yet here i am reading the text and that's and they're not agreeing so yeah, that's. I decided. Big, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that 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 was what started everything for me. So, what I decided to do was, I, I decided, okay, I am going to expand the scope of what I was doing. Initially, I just wanted to read about read the passage, get comfortable with the biblical text, so I could answer questions. Right, you know, First Peter three fifteen, you know, charges us to have, you know, a reasonable justification for our faith, and so. I wanted to I wanted to take that up, but I just from a few a month of studying, there were already more problems. There were more questions than answers. So I decided to expand the scope of my study. I wanted to now understand what is the history of the Bible. How did they come? How did this text? How did this group of texts come together? Mm. Who wrote it? When did they write it? Why do things disagree? I wanted to learn about the history of Christianity. What is it that, what do I believe? And why do I believe what I believe? Where did these beliefs come from? Hmm. And so this, I embarked on a three-year journey. I, 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 I spent money on uh, courses. I mean, I signed up for, you know, academic level um, uh, uh, intro to Bible courses. I bought different books. I started dabbling into apologetics, hmm. trying to understand. And the more I dug in, the more things started to fall apart. Um, I bought this book. It's called uh, The Human Faces of God by Tom Stark. He's a liberal Christian uh, biblical scholar. But he goes into the depiction of God in the Old Testament, right? And again, he wrote this book to serve as a counter to Christians like me at that time who were inerrantists and literalists. Yeah, and I cannot recommend that book. I mean, that book changed my life. Wow. Um, I mean, you, you know, you talk about slavery, you know, in the Bible, you know, Exodus twenty-one, Leviticus twenty-five, where Yahweh gives clear, unambiguous, full-throat endorsement for owning human beings as property. Right in yeah. in, in Exodus twenty-one, and also in Leviticus twenty-five. But even within Exodus 21 and Leviticus 25, the authors don't agree. In Exodus 21, the author states that fellow Israelites can be held under, a, under slavery for seven years, after which you're supposed to free them unless they pledge loyalty to the master forever. In Leviticus 25, however, the author of Leviticus 25 does it clearly states that you cannot have your fellow Israelites under bondage. Hmm. I'm like, wait, 
what what the hell what what have, what have I been believing all this time so I start this journey for three years and I start to dabble into apologetics and then I learn about counter apologetics all right and and then I start to dabble into logic and philosophy and then mm-hmm. that's where I get into the atheist experience head on full on I jump into that show full on so it's Matt Delahunty Tracy Harris um, Jen Peoples, I mean, just a whole bunch of really knowledgeable former Christians who are now atheists. And they they did more to challenge me and my faith than anything, even even more so than my reading of the Bible. Wow. Right? Because they were they were making these arguments that I could not refute. They were bringing up these arguments like, you know, you know, you you know, you have you know, normally you have Christians who use like the cosmological arguments, the theological arguments. All that. For me, I didn't even care about that. For me, I cared about the argument from the supernatural, the argument from the from from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was only at that point when I started to learn that we don't even have the originals of the New Testament. Yeah. The works of the New Testament, the the authors, they they never tell us their name. They're anonymous. The the gospels, they're anonymous. Uh, there's disagreement on when they were written. There's disagreement on even if Jesus existed, right? You mean Richard Carey and the mythicist, you know, Robert Price and those guys. I, I got exposed to things that completely challenged my deeply held beliefs. And it, it just, it got to a point where I couldn't sustain anymore. So I think very early into my three-year journey, my belief in the inerrancy and literalism uh, and the, the inerrancy in the inerrancy and literalism of the Bible fell. I did not believe that anymore. I was like, clearly the Bible has issues. Hmm. It cannot be. It cannot be. It's not. It's clearly not inerrant because there are errors in here. And then I think probably like a year and a half, two years in, my I completely discarded the Bible. I did not. I thought the Bible was a piece of crap. Hmm. I, I, I was like, yeah, this is this is this is not even worth anything like I, I just I discarded it but I still hold on to my belief in oh, God okay. I still hold on to my belief in Jesus I just didn't think much of the Bible and then I'd say two and a half years in that changed too like I the I was no longer convinced that Jesus was this you know savior guy who came down to like I I, I, I came to accept that yeah maybe there was a guy Jesus, who was an apocalyptic preacher who wandered, you know, the Palestine, you know, Palestine preaching uh, a, a message of uh, repentance. You know, yeah. Jesus, you know, he was an apocalyptic preacher, and that's all he was. He wasn't supernatural. He wasn't the son of none of that. And I'd say by three years in, my belief in the supernatural died. I did not accept the supernatural anymore. Wow. So that was that was kind of the moment when when it all went away. It was progressive. Even, and at that point, you realized, was, like, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was it was progressive. But even even though I discarded my belief in the supernatural, I still believed in God. Believe it or not, I still believe. Oh, in God. okay. So you hadn't yeah. totally discarded. So every so everything's gone now, except you believe mm-hmm. that God exists. Yes. And, okay. And and. and, and and, and as I look at it, as I look back on it, the, the main reason was a fear of hell. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I was deeply, deeply afraid of hell. Um, uh, and, and the consequences of going to hell scared the living uh, crap out of me. Um, and it wasn't until I stumbled upon... A video series on YouTube by a guy called Number One Son. He has a his deconversion story. Oh. He tells it in three parts, and the last part of his story, the the third uh, video in his series, had to do with hell. And watching that video, it prompted me to go do reading. I actually decided I need to confront hell, and so I had to do research into the idea of hell. And that's where again, more con- the the confusion of Christianity just stood out even more. Well, what is hell? Is hell on earth or is it in a spiritual plane? Depends on which version of Christianity you believe in. Hmm. Uh, do we get sent to hell for eternity 
or do we cease to exist after judgment or does God forgive everybody and we all get a free pass like universalism? Well, again, it depends on which version of Christianity you buy into. Yeah. Uh, uh, is, 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 is hell a, a physical construct or is it a construct of, you know, a, a, it's kind of like a, uh, a, a thing that happens in your head, you know, depends on which there, there are some Christians who think hell isn't literally a place. It's if it's a mental condition. Like you're in anguish, you're in you're in agony all the time, and that's hell. Yeah. It, it, and and I just it just and then I started to also consider like, hold up, there are also Muslims who are afraid of hell. Like I am afraid of the hell that I was brought up to believe in. There is a Muslim who is going through similar doubts that I'm going through, and they're also afraid of hell. The only difference is they're afraid of a different hell. They're not afraid of my hell, and I'm not afraid of their hell. They're afraid of their hell, and I'm afraid of my hell. Yeah. Why? <laughs> why? Like, why what, if, what if my version of hell turns out to be the wrong one, and their version of hell turns out to be the right one? I'm screwed, right? Yeah. So why am I here worrying about hell? Am I, worrying, am I trying to avoid the worst hell or get into the best heaven? And my fear of hell died. Hmm. And when my fear of hell died, I let go of God. I, I, so I was like, that, that was the end. It's like a natural, was, natural death of God there. Yeah, it just, it just died. Because even, even the idea of God, right? I mean, when, when you spend time studying the Old Testament, there are different versions of God. We talk about El, we talk about Yahweh. I mean, I mean it's like, which one, right? Are we talking about, are we, I mean, there are parallels between Yahweh and Baal. I mean, these are different, you know, different sides of the same coin. Of course, of course, we also know now that Zoroastrianism heavily influenced Judea, uh, what became Judaism, which influenced Christianity. So when we talk about God, we talk about the concept of Ahura Mazda or Angri Manu, like, which is it? Uh, you know, so the more information I, I had, the more research I did, the more studying I did, the less grip religion and christianity had on my life so what was what was the fallout in your personal life you had a very religious family and i don't you were going to a really fundamentalist church just prior to all this so what was the fallout in your life when this when you got to this point oh that's a great question um in many ways the fallout is still happening um so the the immediate impact for me was my my now fiance then she was my girlfriend um so when we met in 2015, I was still a Christian, but I was going through the phase of deconversion. So um, uh, she, she was Christian. She was she's Christian, and part of her condition on dating was she wanted to date a Christian man. And so she got to see my deconversion from the front row. Wow. She had a front row seat to my deconversion. And credit to her, she is a wonderful, wonderful woman. She she. She respected my what I went through. She, she was there for me. Um, I lost my mom last year in July, and, and, and my girlfriend was the one who pulled me through it. Oh, um, that's cool. And, yeah, and, and, and so from, from, uh, from that, that relationship, it, it, we, she, she was so cool about it. She understood, and, and she loves me no less, and it didn't matter. Um, now, for the wider for the wider impact, uh, so I obviously I left the church. I, I stopped going to um, that conservative church. My my deconversion is pretty typical. I went from conservative churches to a more liberal church. So I started going to my girlfriend's church, which is very liberal for me anyway. And then liberal church was the last was the last church experience I had before I fully became an atheist. Mm. So uh, I stopped going to, I stopped dealing with the prophets. I stopped, you know, I, I stopped all that. I mean, I still talk to them. They'll still give me prophecies. They don't know I'm an atheist and for them, I'm still, I'm in the closet, but you know, they'll give me prophecies. None of them, all of them are nonsense. And I just kind of laugh at it these days. But <laughs> um, for my immediate family, um, I never told my mother or my dad. Okay. Um, and, 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 and in a way, I regret not having that conversation with my mother. Um, I do. Um, because she, she, she didn't, uh, she died 
without having a full picture of who her son was. Mm. Right? She she you know, she didn't she didn't know me in in my fullness, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. She, no, I totally understand stand what you're saying it's really interesting to me though because other people have had the opposite feeling they they had a grandmother or a, a mother that they just could never tell because it would hurt that person so much so it's really interesting to, for me to hear you say that you actually regret that she didn't know because she didn't have a fuller picture of who you are no and, and don't get me wrong it would have hurt yeah. i knew if, oh it, it, it would but um i i think for me I, I I try to live my life as honestly as I can. Yeah. And I and I and I try to not fake it. I'm not always successful, but I try not to fake it. So um, I I recently came out to my older sister, who's a prophet in the church, a prophetess in the church, and um, and you know she she was shocked. She she uh, she was disappointed. Um, and, uh, she thought it had to do, she thought it was because of my mother passing that that's why, um, uh, uh, but uh, I, had to, I explained to her, like, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with that, but, um, she, you know, she, the usual platitudes, I'll pray for you, you know, I pray that God will give you an experience that you can't deny. I was like, that's, that, that's fine. Do that. But at the same time, also ask him to explain why he supports slavery in the Bible. Right. Because when when I when I when I made it clear to her that I knew what I was talking about when we talk about the Greek or the Hebrew Bible, that changed the tone of the conversation. Yeah, because it wasn't it was clear to her that it wasn't an emotional decision as much as it was an intellectual one. Um, and then as far as the rest of my family, I I plan on coming out to them uh, in the in the next month or so because my wedding is coming up in July and. And I want to get this out before the wedding. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, what what's your what's the reasoning behind that? Oh well, so my girlfriend's family is Christian, um, and my family, if they come, so there is no there is no way that they will come to my wedding and not want to pray. Gotcha. And 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 I don't want that in my wedding. I my. I'm not my my our wedding. My my fiance and I get married. It's a backyard wedding. We have a good friend of ours who is going to be efficient. Uh, we do. My girlfriend and I volunteer in Jamaica every year, and so this is somebody who we've traveled with and volunteered with. We know her very well. She knows I'm an atheist, and she knows I don't want any of the preachy stuff. So I think if my parents, if my family came over and didn't see any of that, they would feel weird. Oh. So, so I want to I want to just manage the expectations ahead of time and say, hey, uh, I'm not one of y'all. I'm not I'm not part of this tribe anymore. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm still the same guy, but I'm not I'm not in this club, and 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 so don't just kind of temper your expectations. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but in terms of uh, you know, I think I've been lucky. Uh, I've been very lucky in that I'm financially independent. I have a, a fiance who is just the world to me. She, we love each other very much. And and me coming out or me being an atheist, the effects are are they're not that significant. And that's and you know nobody. It's not like anybody can starve me of funds or yeah. you know fire me or you know it's it's whatever. That's good. There are other now, people. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so she had said when you first got together, one of the conditions of being a couple was that she needed to know that you were a Christian. So how has she changed in that way? Oh, she, 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 you know, as I've gone through my own uh, deconversion and learning, I pass a lot of that information to her. And I, I don't think she fully, she, I, I think she will recognize it, but some of what I've, discovered and shared with her has moderated some of her own beliefs like so mm -hmm. some of the things that maybe in the past she was sure she believed in now not so much um okay so so we both have changed yeah. you know and, and we've changed together and i think that was really what was important is that we changed together and i was very open i was very transparent with what i was going through and i didn't hide it from her and so she, she's she again. If you meet her, you understand what I mean. She's such a 
warm, open-minded person. That's really and cool. she and so yeah, we 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 have a great relationship. That's wonderful. Uh, that's that's a happy yeah. ending, you know, to to this difficult transition for you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh it it, it is. It is. So <laughs> when you lucked out. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you think back on the fundamentalist Christian version of yourself, it's not been too long. It's been a few years, but what do you think about that person now? Oh, that's a good question. I knew you were going to ask me this one. And I... <laughs> yeah, I have a few set ones I always like to ask. So, yeah. <laughs> I, if, I don't, I don't, you know, sometimes, especially with some of the atheists you find online, you know, they were like, oh, Christians are stupid. You know, they're dumb. I don't think so. I wasn't dumb. I wasn't stupid. I look back at myself and, and I look at myself as a victim of bad ideas. I was indoctrinated into um, a, a set of beliefs that at, at the point, at that point in time, with the best information that I had, I was convinced that I was doing the right thing. Um, and, I, and I don't blame my parents either because they too were indoctrinated into that belief. And they thought that that was the right thing, that raising your child in a, in a strong Christian home, that is the right way to to, to raise a child yeah and they were doing what they thought was the right thing to do and i have to say i had a great childhood my experiences in christianity for the most part were very positive i look back on my church days with a lot of fondness i had a lot of good experiences and so i look back at my fundamentalist self and i say yeah uh, there were mistakes but it was a positive experience but on the flip side I did hurt people. Mm. I I hurt I hurt people, um, and 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 I and, and and I think part of growing up is knowing that sometimes you can't take back the hurt you've caused. But what do you mean? Is there a specific example of, of something you did that you really regret? Well, when I think about like the relationships, like I ended. Gotcha. Because of, um, I think back. I mean. One of the things that I used to do um, when I was in the church is I used to fund ministry work. Um, I, at the time, I thought my calling from God was to fund the spread of the gospel. Yeah. And so I, I, I ponied up, I, I have spent tens of thousands of dollars supporting ministry and subjecting people to these ideas. And these ideas have consequences. And, and, I, and I was part of that. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and I regret that. I do. I, yeah. I truly do. If I, if I could go back and take all that money back, I would. But um, I, like I said, part of growing up is realizing that sometimes you, you've done some things and you don't, you don't get to take it back. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that I, I, I struggle some, sometimes I struggle with that. Um, another thing that I think about is when I was growing up in, so when I was back in Nigeria in boarding school, mm -hmm. Um, there was one of the students who was accused of being gay. Mm. And, and, and one thing to understand is in Nigeria, in Nigeria, homosexuality is a crime. Uh. It is, is, it is a crime punishable by, um, by jail, by, by prison, by prison sentence. God. Um, and, and it is a, it's a deeply homophobic country. Yeah. And I, and I, I am not saying that to cast aspersions on Nigeria or Nigerians. I, I truly, I, I'm, but that is just a thing. It it's is just a fact. Deeply, it's just a fact. It is a deeply homophobic country with a lot of homophobic people. And I was one of those people. And, and I remember this guy um, who was accused of being gay. And, and, and he was, a, a bunch of the students got together and beat him up. Oh my gosh. And, and I was part of that mob. I didn't beat, I didn't personally beat him. But I cheered the beating on, and and I still th this happened. I was probably like fifteen, and I'm I'm thirty four, going on thirty five, and I know I still think about that. It still stays with me uh, till till this day. Um, and and I did that. I was part of that, and, and 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 part of that was thinking of you know what the Bible had to say about you know when a man lies with a man. You know, I was, I was, I believed what the church said that the Bible condemns homosexuality. Of course, when you read the Bible, it has nothing 
absolutely nothing to say about homosexuality. Because when the Bible was written, when the books of the Bible were written, the, the, the homosexuality wasn't a thing. It's a modern coinage. It's a term. It's a label that we've recently invented. There were men who slept with men, but it wasn't necessarily all a bad thing. But the Bible, the, the Bible authors may have had a view of that that was violent, like kill them. And, and we believe that and we, we practice that. And, and, and I, and I, and I, and I, I regret that. I truly do. Yeah. That's, that's really hard coming to terms with things that we've done in our past that we really regret and you can't take back. Yeah. That's, that's a tough life lesson for sure. Yeah, it is. Well, I, in the, in the last few years, what, what's something you learned or experienced that you don't think you would have if you'd stayed a Christian? Oh, this is, <laughs> this is a great one. I love this question. Um, since I did converted and spent, had some time to kind of put some distance between me and Christianity, I have found, I have a newfound appreciation for the Bible. <laughs> I believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, 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 I have found, so when I was a Christian, I looked at the Bible as one unit. It's one voice it says one thing. And, and, and I think that was so dumb, right? Now, knowing what I knew, it, it, I, I, was, I was essentially stealing or robbing the voices of the biblical authors. And yeah. I was robbing them of their own individual unique voices because as I, as I, as I, as I now know, because I still study the Bible, um, each of these authors had a viewpoint. They had their own sets of beliefs. They had their own outlook on the world, and they did not all agree. They had different things to say about all sorts of things. It is, and, and, it, and it is coming to appreciate that these authors had a, a point of view for a particular context, a particular point in time that was unique to that point in time, yeah. and trying to understand it in its context and what they were trying to say in their own voice, as far as we can you know, get past all the redactions and interpolations and the later editing, trying to understand what that is. And, and, and that's, and I have come to find an appreciation for that. And so I'm, I'm a very active user on Reddit. Um, cool. There is a community on Reddit called the X as an ex Christian subreddit. Cool. And, and yeah, it's, it's a really, really, it's really helpful for me. And, um, and, and part of that is we do a weekly Bible study. And in this Bible study, we have people who are actual professional biblical scholars, right? In the real world, wow. Uh, we have we have people who are amateur scholars. You have people like me who are laymen who are just studying it, right? And we all come together and we share our thoughts and we peel back the layers of history. Like we just got done with, uh, we've we're now on. We just got done with the book of Joel, right? Trying to put Joel in its right historical context. Right. And the history is so much richer. Right. It's got, I, I was just having a conversation with my fiance. You know, Easter is coming. Right. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to talk about Jesus and how, you know, Jesus was a prophet, prophesied Messiah. And they're going to reference Isaiah 7. But when you read Isaiah 7, you read it in its proper context. You get it's like this has nothing to do with Jesus. This was a kingdom that was trying to figure out how to survive. The siege of the of of of, um, of northern Israel. There was basically the southern kingdom, Judah, that was under siege by Israel, the northern kingdom, because they wouldn't join forces to fight the Assyrians. And King Ahaz was asking for us. He, he was asking for deliverance. And Isaiah said, "Hey, ask God. Ask God. God will deliver you." And Ahaz was like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll pray, whatever." And God says, "I'll give you a sign, whether you want one or not." And that's when he gives Isaiah this prophecy. Tell him to go find this young maiden. She is with child. Not that she will be with child. She is with child. Mm. And I was like, wait, hold on. This is not a prophecy about Jesus. Yeah. This is a sign for King Ahaz that God will deliver Judah from the siege of the of, of the northern kingdom. Yeah. This is this is that is the context. This has nothing to do with Jesus. And most importantly, this is present tense. It is not future tense. It is not a virgin. It's a young maiden that is already pregnant. 
So yeah. unless Jesus came about in what seven? I think it's the siege of seven, whatever BCE. Like, the, the, no, it's not. It has not been. But but that's what I'm saying is seeing the context, understanding the history, understanding the views of the authors, right? Because a lot of them were had some of it is just propaganda. Like especially when you go into First and Second Kings and uh, First and Second Chronicles, this is it's it's propaganda. And if you understand it, it makes it even more interesting than what it was when I was a Christian. I'm sorry, I went on a I went on a long winded rant there, but it's just no. it is just it's it's beautiful. Yeah, no, that's great. No, I, I actually have had very similar feelings about the Bible. I, I appreciate it, I think, more now for what it is. So I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Well, when you think about the person you were you know, fundamentalist, Nigerian, charismatic Christian, and the person you've transformed into, um, you know, there's been a lot of changes in who, yeah. you, who you are in a sense, but there's always something really positive about ourselves that stays the same through these big life transitions. So what's something that yeah. positive about yourself that you say would never, never, never changed? Yeah. That, that's a fantastic question. I think the biggest, the biggest one is, uh, service, service to others. Um, I've oh, so when I was in the church, I used to volunteer uh, my time in like uh, um, food banks or uh, cooking meals for the homeless or for um, the working poor, um, and even just doing donations and you know helping people. And when I was in the church. The way I interpreted, or the the lens through which I looked through, I looked at what I was doing was, you know, Jesus calls us to serve, right? To honor to honor Jesus, to honor God was to serve the least amongst us. Yeah. So, uh, my service, my sense of helping and being useful to other people, I viewed that as a way to worship God. Now I'm not a Christian anymore. I volunteer more. I <laughs> I give more. And, and, and for me, it's being able to step away to say, no, this has nothing to do with Jesus. This is not, I'm not doing this because I need a reward. I have a finite amount of time on earth and I have resources. I am, I am, more, I am in a position of privilege that other people don't have. So for this time that I am here on earth with the only life that I'm sure that I get, I'm going to help as much as I can. I'm going to try to be a good neighbor as best as I can. Empathy. And that has not changed. The only thing that's changed is the lens through which I look, uh, look at that service. This is, not a, a not ser- this is not in service of Jesus or God. No, this is in service of my fellow human being. Because there's no one else here to help us. We are all we've got. Whether we like it or not. And if we're going to solve our problem, then we need to come together. We need to find ways to bridge some of the real deep fundamental issues that we have as human beings to help each other. Because if we don't, we're screwed. And that's that's pretty much that hasn't changed. Just the, that's just, just the same the same sense of service, the same self sense of help. It's still there. Yeah, I I love that. Just being I loved I, that was just so well put. Um, we're not in service of God. We're in service of our fellow human being. It is. Yeah. That's great. It is. Yeah. Well, you know, there's probably someone listening right now who is deconverting or has deconverted from Christianity. Uh, what encouragement, having gone through deconversion yourself, would you offer that person or what guidance would you give them? Yeah, no, this is, that is a question we get often on our, on the ex Christian subreddit. Um, one thing I often tell people going through this process is, don't rush. Don't feel that there needs to be a end goal. Like, oh gosh, I got a deep. No, no, just take, slow it down. Most important thing is make sure that you have good reasons for what you're doing. Challenge your beliefs. Even, even, even. Like when I was coming out of religion, I just, you know, I, I, I was, I was of the opinion that hey, the Bible is false, right? I, I came to that conclusion before I had spent enough time studying the Bible. I, I you know, I, I kind of jumped the gun there. Now I'm kind of going back and doing more in-depth study. But 
I would say take your time. Don't feel rushed. Don't feel rushed to make a decision one way or the other. Don't feel pressured into making a decision one way or the other. That's cool. If Christianity is true, the evidence will bear it out, regardless of your doubts. If it isn't true, the lack of evidence will bear itself out, regardless of your position. And you just have to be willing to be open-minded and be honest enough with yourself to go where the evidence leads you. And if the evidence leads you to Christianity, hey, good for you. If it leads you to Islam, hey, good for you. If it leads you to a path of atheism or non-belief, then that's what it is. Uh, I, and I think that's, that's probably the challenge. It's probably the toughest challenge. Uh, but just be honest with yourself. Don't feel pressure, don't feel rushed. And find community. Community is important. That's pretty uh, nice. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. But if you find it, and there are a lot of places online that are coming on, um, that are coming online that are helpful. Um, like I said, the ex Christian subreddit is there are thousands of us of all stripes from all backgrounds of Christianity who've deconverted. Come, 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 come over there. Um, there, you know, there's the atheist community of Austin. They have a really active Facebook presence. I mean, just find community, plug in. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask what you think may be stupid questions because, to be honest, coming out of Christianity, there is no stupid question. I, I can tell you that much. So that's, that's those are the things I would say. Yeah, great advice. And you already answered my next question. Um, Subreddit, uh, Reddit, I've never had someone mention that as a, as a resource, so that's awesome. Is there another resource that you were wanting to mention, or is that, if I were to ask you for one, is that the one you would you would suggest uh well okay that so what helped me was i that sub the ex-christian subreddit um on youtube there is a series uh by a user called number one son it's n-u-m-b-e-r-o-n-e-s-o-n -E -E and it's a he has a series of his deconversion from christianity i cannot recommend that highly enough cool. it is so good um, and then if you want resources around the Bible, just to help you poke into some of the early writings of the patriarchs, um, there's a website called earlychristianwritings.com. Um, it also has, it, it has every book of the Bible. Also the canonical and non-canonical books. It has the letters of the early church fathers from Augustine, Irenaeus. It has everything. You, you want to read Secret Mark? You'll find Secret Mark there. I mean, it, <laughs> awesome. and, it, and, it, and it has a web forum that you can ask questions to. So I recommend that. That's some great stuff. Well, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you wanted to share? One thing just to put like a caveat on is, or to just you know sprinkle on there is, uh, it, the, I'm a black atheist, right? And, and and coming out of Christianity for black folks is it's a little bit more challenging or a little bit more it has a little bit more nuance than for non-black folks mm -hmm. just because like I said the the how deeply embedded Christianity is within the black community yeah. both within the United States and outside in the, 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 the in the diaspora um, and it can be hard it can be very isolating I can tell you I, I felt very alone at a lot of periods of my of my deconversion um, and, and I think it's important to reach out. Um, there's the not, uh, non -black, uh, non black non-believers group on Facebook. There's guys like Alex Jules, um, Nandita, um, Mandisa Thomas, yep. um, Dr. Anthony Pinn. Um, they have their resources for black, black Christians who are going through this process that speak to, your, that speak to our particular cultural context that help you, or at least try to help you on that journey, um, because it can be it can be quite isolating, I can assure you of that, it can be. Yeah, well that's some great advice, because the isolation and feeling alone is hard for any person deconverting, but in particular for someone from a community that it's even maybe, you know, it's even more difficult to deconvert from a an extra strong community of people that are extra extra Christian is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's great advice. 
to to mention yeah. to people. Yeah. Well, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah. Um, so you can reach me over email at uh, kevbest83 at gmail dot com. Um, I'm I, I respond to emails. Or if you are on if you come on the ex Christian subreddit. Uh, my, my username there is Red Shrek, R-E-D-S-H-R-E-K. I'm very active, especially in the weekly Bible study session. So um, just reach out. I, I respond. That's great. Well, Benny, I appreciate you reaching out to me. And, um, you know, after I kind of put it out there to people like, hey, we need some, you know, a variety of stories and people's um, deconversion, uh, not just kind of the same old thing. And, and uh, you reached out and, and offered to tell your story. You talked about reaching out, people reaching out and finding community, and, and you're doing that for people. You're putting your story out there, and uh, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to people who are listening, so thank you very much for doing that. Good. Uh, thank you. What you do is very important. I can, uh, if your voice and the platform you built to allow these voices to be heard by so many people is, is so important. And, and it cannot be overestimated. Um, and, and I really want to thank you because it was helpful for me. And I, and I, and I just hope you keep on going as long as you can. Well, it means the world to me. I really appreciate you saying that. And um, yeah, it was really, really fun talking to you. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Absolutely. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks for listening to Voices of Deconversion. Be sure to join us next time by subscribing to the podcast. If you'd like to learn more, check out our newsletter at vodpodcast.com.